good good evening everybody i warmly welcome you all to the webinar uh, jointly organized by uh, sri lanka college of pulmonologists and the candy society of medicine sri lanka i'm dr tushara galamida one of the consultant respiratory physician from putlam sri lanka uh, as we all know pleural diseases are one of the major clinical problem that we encounter in our day to day clinical practice therefore it is of utmost importance to improve and update our knowledge on pleural diseases especially because it is a rapidly uh, evolving field to serve this purpose the college of sri lanka pulmonologists and the candy society of medicine sri lanka jointly has organized this uh, webinar on pleural diseases in this webinar we have planned to talk on several aspects of pleural diseases uh, with the participation of uh, several experts on the topic uh, both from overseas and locally there will be four lectures uh, or so, uh, each speaker will be given roughly around 30 minutes to deliver the lecture and if one of you have any questions uh, with regards to the topics discussed you can uh send your questions through the q and a uh, option that you have in this uh, uh, software and uh, uh one message to tell you that if anybody of you uh, find it difficult to uh, log into uh, the webinar through the uh, link provided uh, you can access the webinar uh, through the Uh, facebook page of the sri lanka college of pulmonologists uh without uh, further delay uh, we will be starting the uh, webinar the first lecture uh, will be done by dr afla sadikin on how to approach a patient with unilateral pleural effusion dr afla sadikin is currently working as a consultant respiratory physician at national hospital of sri lanka colombo he obtained md medicine in year 2008 and was board certified as a consultant respiratory physician in 2013 he is a board member of specialty board in clinical care med critical care medicine of post of post graduate institute of medicine university of colombo he has special interest in interventional pulmonology and critical care pulmonology Dr. Afla Sadikin is going to deliver on how to approach a patient with unilateral pleural effusion. Over to you, Afla. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tushar Galabade, for uh, giving that uh, kind introduction. So, uh, So let me. Uh, I hope uh, the, the the slides are on, on Zoom, right? Okay, right. So basically, uh, first of all, I want to thank the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists uh, for giving me this opportunity, and also it's a privilege and an honor. Uh, to be on this platform with some uh, renowned speakers, especially Professor Najib, uh, who has done a lot of work on pleural disease, and uh, it's my uh, honor to be uh, in this uh, forum to give a talk on uh, approach to unilateral pleural effusion. The amount of fluid in the pleural space depends on the balance of hydrostatic and oncotic pressure between parietal and distal pleura. The resorption mainly depends on the lymphatic vessels in the parietal pleura. So, therefore, any disturbance in the above system will cause excessive collection of the fluid or the pleural effusion will uh, be in picture. So, if whenever there is a pleural effusion, uh, it indicates there is a presence of pulmonary or pleural pathology with extra pulmonary disease. So there are so many uh, uh, pathological mechanisms to cause fluid accumulation in the pleural space, but 
in case of unilateral fusion, the increased pulmonary capillary permeability and the increased permeability of the pleural membrane with the obstruction of lymphatic drainage is one of the main important pathological mechanisms. For the unilateral pleural effusion, there are many differential diagnoses, many, many causes. So there are more than 50 causes uh, documented in the uh, literature. So narrow downing your differential diagnosis is something very important. So if you look at the uh, number of causes, always there are some common causes, common things are always common. However, some of the least common causes are not so uncommon uh, when we start investigating unilateral pool effusion, such as the um, uh, chromatoid arthritis related effusion and chylothorax, pseudothorax, and in our context, even urinothorax. Uh, we, we see quite a few cases uh, on and off. So always uh, diagnosing uh, unilateral pleural effusion is a challenge. Why? Because we are seeing a pathological process in a close inner cavity where there is no direct access. So the initial manifestation of a patient sometimes are without symptoms and, and uh, it is quite difficult to pinpoint to the direct cause. And there are so many causes for the development of a process and sometimes uh, some of the etiological reasons are depending on the local epidemiology as well. However, over the years and the uttermost important thing is to look for a single etiology. However, some of the studies now have come up to show that it's sometimes multifactorial. So I'll play, I, I will just quote one study at my, in my presentation to show how important it is to look for a second cause in certain occasions. However, with these challenges, sometimes accurate diagnosis get delayed because of wrong approach, sometimes or long approach we take for the diagnosis. Like any other disease process, it is quite important to understand and to have a good diagnostic clue on the clinical assessment. And this Diagnose, uh, the clinical assessment is uh, paramount for a clinic, clinician to differentiate transudate from exudate at the outset. Not only that, some of the assessment of some of the risk factors for especially for malignant pleural effusion and also for TB pleural effusion is, is important. Remember, sometimes the local epidemiology, especially in this part of the world, TB pleural effusion is so common and you have to take into account. Nevertheless, occupational history and drug, drug history is something where you have to focus on and on your clinical assessment. And we see quite a lot of drugs which can cause pleural effusion, example, uh, amiodarone, methotrexate, and so on. When it comes to evaluation, the imaging of the pleura is one of the first steps we go through. That is uh, starting from a chest radiograph since it's freely available and easy to perform with less, in, uh, with the rather no uh, complications. So many days that the fluid is more than 200 ml in a, a PAV, you will see this meniscus and you should be able to clearly uh, identify the effusion. However, when the effusion is small, that is like more than little, more than 50 ml, you may be able to see in a lateral chest X-ray. However, with the advent of ultrasound and the interest we have developed on ultrasound uh, to uh, localize and detect pleural effusion, the use of lateral chest X-rays now uh, it is not commonly practiced. There are certain situations where your chest X-ray can be missed for pleural effusion, especially when there is a subpalmonic effusion, especially when you look at the pseudodiaphragm uh, of the apex of the pseudodiaphragm is missed at, as a lateral displacement. So, as I said before, the after the clinical judgment, uh, always uh, the ultrasound chest, looking at the pleural space, is something we have to be focused on. That is, uh, we, there are so many studies proven that ultrasound is superior uh, when it comes to diagnosing uh, and quantifying the pleural effusion compared to radiograph. 
However, it's not only that. Distinguishing the plural fluid from the thickening is sometimes with high specificity, you can do that with the color doctor study. So immediately after chest radiograph, I think it is tried, quite important to assess the plural space uh, in a, with the ultrasound guidance. And it is not only just confirming the presence of fluid, also uh, it is important to differentiate uh, through ultrasound uh, of plural thickening and underlying consolidation. That will give some indirect help towards your uh, uh, diagnostic and uh, clinical management. There is always a, a sensitivity, higher sensitivity uh, when it compares with chest radiograph. It has been proven that there is a 97% uh, aspiration success uh, where uh, when it is done under ultrasound guidance. And there is less complication rate, such as development of pneumothorax and bleeding. And there have been uh, very minimum organ uh, puncture. Basically, uh, it is in, in addition to that, there is a lot of diagnostic information you can have by ultrasound examination of the pleural space with fluid. So it is apart from the uh, uh, echogenicity, there are so many other findings where you can uh, uh, pick in ultrasound of the chest. So detection of the plural fluid septations, they say that it has a greater sensitivity than CT. So it, it has a bigger role to play on plural effusion assessment. However, the plural uh, assess, uh, fluid assessment through ultrasound uh, chest has to be, you know, it, has, it is with the respiratory physicians where they deliver a thoracic ultrasound uh, service and they have to have a formal training and a sign off showing a good diagnostic accuracy and utilization with safety. And not only that, they have to have a prospective records for their uh, number of scans and their diagnostic accuracy on detection and also their intervention to uh, intervention uh, with the help of ultrasound. It is not only just identifying the uh, fluid, also the level of echogenic pattern and the loculation, the plural thickening, as I said, is also clearly uh, uh, visualized and uh, demonstrable where you are not only the just diagnosis, also to, the, to guide you for your interventions. CT scan is always helpful when there is an exudate to identify, uh, is identified, and but there when there is no obvious cause. So always a question: when you have a moderate to large effusion, will I do the scan before or after the uh, free drainage? So it has been proven that post-drainage imaging will not give any additional information to influence your clinical decision-making process. So if whenever there is a question about exudates and then there is no obvious cause to be found, it is, we should not delay the performing a contrast CT. So the, when the question comes that when we do the contrast CT, uh, what are we really looking at it in the arterial phase or venous phase? It has been shown that when we go through the venous phase, we have a better uh, uh, visualization of your pleura, uh, especially thickening and nodularity. When it is a co complicated paranormonic effusion and empyema, your imaging, choice of, uh, imaging study of choice is this contrast CT scan of the chest. It is just not only the pleural enhancement with pleural sign, also appearance of gas bubbles in the pleural space, especially when it is not when there is no therapeutic procedure done before uh, the imaging. And apart from that, you will have a better understanding of septation, loculation, and the anatomy, especially when we decide on an interventional involvement of clearing the pleural space, uh, especially by the surgeons. So this uh, uh, cohort of patients, we they sub-analyzed from the MIS-2 trial. Uh, they found it is not just only detecting and uh, assessing the uh, empyema on the CT scan, also it gives a lot of uh, the additional uh, findings, especially the consolidation, cavitation, and in addition to that, uh, there is a lot of other um, additional features which can help you in the long run. The plural fluid analysis is something which is a uh, cornerstone of your uh, clinical uh, assessment. 
and uh, investigation. So it is important to understand that obtaining a sample under, under ultrasound guidance is mandatory uh, and recommended on the guidelines. And it is always important for read analysis to start with differentiating from transudate from exudate. It is important to understand that the visual guidance and the physical characteristic uh, on the, at the site of aspiration is quite important because some of the pathologies can be easily differentiated and uh, picked up on the uh, macroscopic findings. And sometimes we come across blood stain or hemorrhagic uh, effusion where we may be a little confused thinking, is it a hemothorax? So you can use the plural fluid hematocrit as a, uh, com uh, with, with a with comparing with the uh, same uh, the patient's peripheral blood hematocrit. Plural fluid pH assessment is something uh, has been uh, uh, very important for those patients suspected plural infection. And when we draw the sample into a heparinized blood gas yes, syringe, uh, we can uh, uh, get the pH measurement through a normal blood gas machine. But however, the accuracy is quite important in because there are some uh, confounding factor, factors like residual air, lignocaine presence of lignocaine in the plural space, and also analysis delay can alter your pH, and that can uh, change your clinical management. So, however, if you have a proper pH, if it is less than 7.2, it indicates that the, 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 there is a tube drainage from the plural space. There have been some talk about low pH in malignant effusion, whether about the prognostic implication. And they are, there was a thought about shorter survival and extensive disease and no chance of uh, successful plural disease with very low pH. However, in the meta-analysis, it clearly showed that there was no relationship between plural pH and survival of the patient, especially with, with the first three months of diagnosis. The microbiological studies are not routinely performed. However, use of blood culture bottle for the sample collection, in addition to the standard culture bottle, will increase the microbiological diagnostic yield by 21%. The one study had shown and a routine uh, uh, shown that there is a routine culture of rural fluid is not cost effective and it is not clinically useful. So it has to be requested on plural infection is when it is suspected clinically and biochemically. So this is something we have to be really uh, careful uh, when there is, uh, when we order for microbiological studies. So there are some standard patterns of tests, biochemical assays we are looking at plural, in the plural fluid. That is the protein, glucose, pH, LDH, and ADA, differential cell count, and the cytology. However, interpreting all these biochemical parameters should be with no knowledge of sensitivity and specificity of these tests. And also, it is quite difficult to uh, pinpoint each parameter by and coming to a definitive diagnosis. Because sometimes you may have to use two, three parameters together to come to a a specific uh, diagnosis because sometimes it is not only just the exudation, exudate plural fluid you are going to diagnose with it, it is also important to narrow down your differential diagnosis for that in exudative fluid diffusion. For as an example, you have a low glucose and uh, uh, very uh, high LDH with a very high protein, your likely cause of TB is going to be very high. In case of very low protein, your chance of getting uh, with the clinical context, you have to think of causes like urinothorax and intact lung. Same with your cellular predominance, where I will be discussing in the next slides. So it is the transmute process exudate always gives the information about how the plural fluid is accumulated. So exudate diffusion identifying exudate effusion after exuding a transudate effusion is not going to be that easy uh, in some instances. For that matter, the LIGHTS criteria gives you uh, a sensitivity of 94.7% with 80% specificity. Having said that, still 25% of the transudates are still misclassified as exudates. So your LIGHTS criteria may give some uncertainty uh, when it comes to diagnosing exudative effusion. 
So what the light criteria says is your plural fluid to serum protein ratio when it's greater than, greater than 0.5 and your plural fluid to LDH ratio greater than 0.6 and plural fluid LDH more than two thirds of the upper limit of the normal serum LDH. This we have been practicing over and over again with a lot of um, success. However, in that 25% of transudates, which you think it is going to be misclassified exudates, you can use the pro BNP level and your clinical ju judgment to identify those transudates. So now, when it comes for tuberculosis pleural effusion, they are, it is quite uh, common in our clinical scenario. So the biochemical marker in plural fluid ADA is very important since it is a cost-effective chemical biomarker. There have been a lot of studies over, over years to show the importance of ADA and its sensitivity and specificity. But if you look at the sensitivity, there have been a lot of big variation. However, out, uh, in a meta-analysis, it showed that it has a sensitivity of 92% with a specificity of 90%. So we have a, a good biomarker with, with cost-effective, uh, with good sensitivity and specificity. However, we see some false positivity with the rheumatoid effusion and empyema. So to increase the uh, specificity, we can use the isoenzyme ADA2 levels. However, in clinical practice, it may be a little challenging. So to overcome uh, this and also to, uh, to distinguish the tuberculous plural effusion from paraneumonic effusion, there have been some studies shown uh, of the plural LDH and ADA ratio. So it is being said that it is highly predictive of TB plural effusion as a with a cutoff value of 16.2. So it is something we have to be uh, practicing in, again and again because it is a cost-effective manner of uh, narrow down in your diagnosis from uh, paraneumonic plural effusion. So this study, and we when we did it in National Hospital of Sri Lanka in Colombo with 177 uh, patients, we found that the median of 11.6 of uh, LDH and ADO ratio with a mean of 16.8, suggesting that it's a good diagnostic tool to um, uh, diagnose TB plural effusion by excluding uh, to exclude paranormal plural effusion. The differential cell count, again, it's something uh, very helpful to narrow down your differential diagnosis. However, it does not give an underlying etiological etiology. But looking at the number of blood cells, especially the neutrophil and lymphocytes, will narrow down your disease process. However, sometimes the high neutrophil count may give you a, a question about uh, 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 overlap with the lymphocytes count since early tuberculosis also can uh, present with high neutrophil count. How, but in case of uh, lymphocyte count more than 50%, you get to see there are quite a lot of common causes where you may be able to narrow down your differential diagnosis. Though the eosinophil count is relatively non-specific, it can play a role, especially when you are looking at uh, patients with asbestos related effusion, also in some cases of malignant effusion. Plural fluid cytology is a fundamental part of your investigative process, and it is quick and minimally invasive for suspected malignancy. Though the sensitivity range from 40 to 87 percent, it is still an uh, important diagnostic tool. And there is always a question that what the amount of fluid I'm going to take for a better diagnostic yield. It has been shown that even we, we, when the fluid is more than 50 ml, it is not going to increase your diagnostic yield. So the recommended uh, fluid amount is about 20 to 40 ml. So if we can have a cell block anosmia together, their yield is higher to diagnose your malignancy. So, but we have to be really mindful. You have to have a very close discussion with your histology lab uh, for about sample collection method and also the transport because there can be situation where your uh, inadequate uh, or improper sampling will be an issue for proper diagnostic yield. There have been some success on uh, uh, cell block and the clot doing uh, immunohistochemistry to narrow down your uh, diagnosis of malignancy. 
So this large prospective study done by Arnold and the group showed that the role of cytology has a sensitivity of about uh, uh, the, the sensitivity of fluid in cytology was about 46%. But the interesting thing here is the sensitivity dependent on the primary lung malignancy or the secondary lung malignancy. So in that, especially in ovarian uh, malignancy, uh, the, the, though it is a, it is a secondary uh, effusion or pleural effusion and the sensitivity is very high. And in case of lung primary lung malignancy, it is with the adenocarcinoma. However, it is important to understand that the, you are, we are not going to wait for the cytology results for a definitive diagnosis by the biopsy. So uh, the, when it comes to markers of the pleural fluid, there had been some uh, assessment for rheumatoid, rheumatoid pleural effusion by uh, checking the uh, pleural fluid glucose to serum ratio, which is less than 0.5 and pH 7.3. And the, uh, the uh, sensitivity is about 80%. Though the chylothorax and pseudochylothorax is uncommon, I'm not telling again it's uncommon because sometimes it is um, you know, picked up so frequently in certain locations. The chylo presence of chylomicrons and high triglyceride level you always confirm the chylothorax. And presence of cholesterol crystals in your pleural fluid, if you specifically ask where you can diagnose pseudochylothorax. The tumor markers that are not routinely requested and done. However, there have been some, some studies looking at the CEA and CA125, 15.3, and CIFRA for the combined sensitivity of 54%. But there is a, a good uh, uh, specificity and to some degree of sensitivity when it comes to malignant mesothelioma by looking at the mesothelium uh, tumor marker. The plural biopsy is something uh, always uh, needed in case of uh, in case of a uh, in case of a pleural effusion where 40 percent of the time of those exudates remain still undiagnosed even after uh, proper evaluation of the pleural fluid and the imaging so so the closed pleural biopsy or the abraham needle have been uh, in use with a sensitivity about ranging from 27 to 60 percent in malignancy however in tuberculosis it has been high uh, about 67 to 92 percent given the rate of complications which is about 15 percent including pain pneumothorax hemothorax with all that the use of abraham needle is now dying off so still the recommendation is going for a uh, plural biopsy through thoracoscopy which i will be discussing in the next few slides so now use of image guided cutting needle uh, for percutaneous pleural biopsy is being popular. Now it has been shown that uh, patients with um, in the CT scan finding, especially having the focal abnormal pleural area, will give a higher yield, and it is very useful for those patients when we can't do thoracoscopy. Thoracoscopy is the investigative of choice in those pleural exudative pleural effusion, where most of the time those exudative effusions are having a diagnostic conclusion with a suspected malignancy. It is not only just for the diagnostic purpose, it is also for the therapeutic uh, intervention. So the medical thoracoscopy has been shown it is a very safe, well-tolerated procedure. So in pool studies have shown that it has a, a diagnostic sensitivity of 92% and well below complication rate compared to the other close plural biopsy procedures. It is not only that, also can be used for telephone or drudge for plural diseases with a successful rate of 9, 80 to 90%. So it is quite important to understand the medical importance of medical thoracoscopy. I'm sure my uh, next speaker would be touching on that and uh, further enhancing on that uh, knowledge. Radio-assisted thoracoscopy surgery is something done by the thoracic surgeon. It requires a general anesthetic. It is a very important procedure for certain patients, not only just because of for the biopsy purpose, also to uh, assess the um, uh, to to involve with the corrective uh, uh, treatment modality and for advancement of the pleural space for any further intervention. It has a uh, when it comes to the biopsy, it has a successful rate of ninety five percent for malignancy. Now. Just to uh, finish my talk, I, as I said, started from my talk, uh, there is 
it is not the only unilateral coronal effusion with one cause. There had been uh, some um, causes or multiple etiologies for a primary diagnosis, especially with the increasing age. So in this study done by Binkrift and the group, they found that out of 130 subjects, 38, that means 30% of them patients had multiple causes for the coronal effusion. And it's very interesting to find out, even in malignancy patients, you have secondary causes like heart failure and other secondary causes. So why it is important to determine this group of patients uh, uh, secondary cause, not only just for the diagnosing, also to improve the symptoms and to optimize the treatment. So it is quite understandable that unilateral pool refusion is a common and clinical radiological finding and also uh, not uh, easy in, when it comes to the diagnostic process to conclude for an etiological uh, cause. So it is always challenging in certain instances. And it, the, all the results, including the plural fluid analysis, should be interpreted with each different clinical context. And we have to know about the pitfalls of each test. Ultrasound is a key imaging modality. It is quick, safe, and a sensitive diagnostic tool. And that, that tool has to be used with uh, uh, more and more uh, for the betterment of the patient. So the standard panel of biochemical assay with protein, glucose, LGH, ADA, and uh, also use of uh, differential cell count and cytology is something we should be done routinely. However, microbiological assay, it should be done on appropriate setting when there will be a suspect of total infection. So interpreting all these studies we need some knowledge of sensitivity and specificity of all those tests. So the thoracoscopy is the gold standard of diagnosing extruded pleural effusion and for pleural basis for the final diagnosis, for the final management. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sadikin, for a very uh, informative uh, and a practical lecture. Uh, then, uh, our next speak are the uh, the question and answer session we will leave for the uh, end of the uh, uh, end of the four lectures uh, i would like to invite our next speaker dr carrie leong currently uh, she works as a consultant in respiratory medicine and critical care in singapore general hospital also the deputy director of clinical services in sing health lung center dr kuri Leong obtained her medical degree from National University of Singapore in 2008, became a specialist in respiratory medicine and intensive care medicine in 2017 and 18, respectively. She's actively involved in interprofessional education of medical and nursing students, doctors, nurses, and allied health professionals. She has also some special interest in interventional pulmonology and fluoroscopy. Over to you, Dr. Carrie Leong. Thank you, everyone, and thanks for the kind invite. I hope you are able to see my slides. Okay. Good evening. So today I'll be talking about pneumothorax, to drain or not to drain. So first we'll start off with a case, and this is essentially a very typical profile that we see commonly. Um, we have it here, a 28-year-old male. He's a sales executive. He smokes five sticks a day for 10 years, and he presents with intermittent chest pain for one day. On examination, his respiratory rate is 24 per minute. He's not tachyapnic, and he's saturating 96% on room air. So given that, that he has no past history of notes, we are dealing with a first episode of a spontaneous, um, primary spontaneous pneumothorax, and uh, what shall the next course of action be? Shall we observe and uh, give him an early respiratory clinic follow-up? Should we do a needle aspiration? What about insert the chest tube? Or maybe even refer to a thoracic surgeon? So let's look to our existing guidelines, which will hopefully guide us along. This is the British Thoracic Society or BTS guidelines from 2010. Starting from the top, our patient has a spontaneous pneumothorax and it's a primary pneumothorax, also it's unilateral. It's just about two centimeters from the hilum and he's not breathless at the moment. 
And so we now have a uh, little trouble deciding if we should discharge him with a follow-up in a respiratory clinic or if we should go ahead and aspirate pneumothorax. What about the American College of Chest Physicians or ACCP guidelines? For stable patients with small pneumothoraces, they recommend observation in the emergency department and discharge if no progression. Whilst for larger pneumothoraces, chest tube with either a Heimlich valve or underwater seal is recommended. Aspiration, on the other hand, is not recommended by the ACCP guidelines. And notably, the two guidelines use different measurement cutoffs for large versus small pneumothoraces. And so now we come back to our patient. Having looked up the BTS and ACCP guidelines, we still cannot decide what to do for him. Save for the fact that we have decided not to refer him to the thoracic surgeon up front. Let's now turn to the latest evidence for inspiration. This is the conservative versus interventional treatment for spontaneous pneumothorax trial published this year. Intervention treatment with either aspiration or chest tube comes at the risk of pain, organ injury, bleeding and infection, and oftentimes require hospitalization. Hence, this trial aimed to see if patients with a moderate to large first episode of primary spontaneous pneumothorax could be managed conservatively. Patients were follow up for 12 weeks and the primary outcome was lung re-expansion within eight weeks. Out of the 2,600 patients assessed for eligibility, about 1,900 met at least one exclusion criteria and hence only about 316 underwent randomization. As such, this was actually a very select group of patients given the exclusion criteria and there may also have been an element of selection bias as well. This is especially given the fact that it took 39 hospitals six years to recruit just 316 patients, which meant an average of only 1.3 patients per year per center. Now taking a deeper dive into the study protocol, which the authors had published ahead of the actual trial. Patients in the conservative arm were given analgesia and observed with a chest x-ray four hours after and were discharged if stable. Patients in the interventional arm had a small ball sounding a chest tube. If the pneumothorax improved and drain was no longer bubbling, a repeat chest x-ray was done. And if no reaccumulation, the drain was removed and patients were discharged. If not, the patients were admitted. This trial used the Collins method, which is essentially a formula involving the sum of various interpleural distances to estimate the pneumothorax size in terms of percentages. And looking at the patient characteristics, we can see that these were moderate to large pneumothoraces between 63 to 67% of lung volume. Looking at the primary outcome, which was radiological resolution at eight weeks, we can see that essentially conservative management was non-inferior to interventional treatment. And only 15% of patients in the conservative group subsequently required any intervention. In terms of symptom resolution, both groups were similar. However, in terms of hospital length of stay and days of work, the conservative group had better outcomes. Just give me a moment there. Okay, now looking at the adverse outcomes, uh, the interventional group had more adverse events and these were mostly related to chest tubes. Also of note is that tension pneumothorax is a relatively rare event in primary spontaneous pneumothorax. There was only one such patient out of 162 in the conservative group. And this brings us to the ERS task force statement on primary spontaneous pneumothorax published in 2015, five years before the PSP trial. And this sums up the approach to conservative treatment very well. Essentially, in selected patients with minimal or no symptoms and good access to medical care in case of deterioration, observation alone may be appropriate. Again, management depends on clinical symptoms rather than the size of the pneumothorax. And a conservative approach may be appropriate as tension pneumothorax from PSP is extremely rare as we saw in the PSP trial as well. But what about aspiration then? After all, the BTS guidelines do recommend aspiration as the first-line treatment in symptomatic PSPs more than two centimeters in size. 
our center did a systematic review back in 2004, and essentially we concluded that simple aspiration resulted in a shorter hospital stay. There was also no significant difference in success at one week or recurrence at one year. The 2015 ERS Task Force Statement also concluded that needle aspiration is an effective initial management of spontaneous pneumothorax. This approach resulted in reduced hospital days and admissions. However, there is a relatively high failure rate of 25 to 50% in PSP, and this is the major disadvantage of aspiration. Fast forward to 2017, and this is a randomized control trial from Norway, comparing needle aspiration and chest tube drainage. They looked at a mixed population of both primary and secondary spontaneous pneumothorax patients. The primary outcome here was duration of hospital stay. Secondary outcomes included immediate and one week success rates, and this table shows the results. In all patients, the length of hospital stay was shorter and the immediate success rate was higher in the needle aspiration group. These results were replicated in the primary and secondary pneumothorax subgroups. There was no significant difference, however, in the one week success across all groups. However, a deeper dive into the results reveals a significant failure rate. There was a 50% failure rate on first aspiration and another 50% failure on second aspiration. Overall, the success rate for aspiration as the sole treatment was only about 70%. Again, this echoes previous studies and guidelines. Now we return to our patient. And so the emergency department has decided on chest tube placement for him. Do we now then discharge our patient for respiratory clinic follow-up? or do we need to admit him? Our center did a small trial of 48 patients back in 2011, comparing mini chest tube with Heimlich valve versus needle aspiration in outpatient management. We found that there was no difference in failure rate between groups. However, more patients in the needle aspiration group required a repeat procedure and also admission to the ward as compared to the Heimlich valve group. Hence, we concluded that a small ball chest drain and one way valve was a reasonable alternative to manual aspiration. And outpatient management with Heimlich valves were also mentioned as a reasonable alternative in the 2015 ERS Task Force Statement. This is a systematic review of ambulatory treatment with Heimlich valves in the management of pneumothorax. 18 patients were included. The success with Heimlich valve alone was about 85%, and treatment as an outpatient was successful in 78% of cases. Heimlich valves were also successfully used in not just primary spontaneous pneumothoraces, but also secondary spontaneous pneumos, uh, as well as eutrogenic ones. On the right, you can see an example of a small ball chest tube with a Heimlich valve. With such a compact setup, the obvious advantages are certainly better comfort and mobility, and also reduction in hospital admissions. So this brings us to the latest study published in July this year. This is the first uh, randomized control trial comparing ambulatory management versus standard BTS guideline-based care for primary spontaneous pneumothorax. The ambulatory device used here was the rocket medical pleural device, which is essentially an eight French catheter mounted on an 18 gauge needle and a self-contained one-way valve and vent. Whereas the BTS guideline management included aspiration, standard chest tube insertion, or both. The primary outcome here was hospital stay in the first 30 days. Secondary outcomes included pain and dyspnea scores, need for further procedures, complications, as well as recurrence rates. Looking at the primary outcome here, the median hospitalization was significantly shorter in the ambulatory treatment group at zero days, as compared to the standard care group, who required a median of four days of hospital stay. And looking at the need for further procedures, if you look at the table on the left in the ambulatory care group, only 21% of patients required additional procedures as compared to 35% of those in the standard care group. And looking at the table on the right, the mean number of procedures per patient was 1.2 in the ambulatory group, which was lower compared to the standard care group. Of note, in the standard care group, 68% of patients received aspiration as the initial treatment. Thereafter, 38 of them, or 32%, ultimately still required chest tube insertion. Looking at the adverse events, those in the ambulatory care arm 
had more adverse events versus the standard care arm, and serious adverse events occurred only in the ambulatory care arm. However, in this study, serious adverse events or SAEs were defined as any such event requiring hospital admission. Whereas in comparison, insertion of a chest tube after failed aspiration and admission to the hospital was not classified as an SAE in the standard arm because this constituted normal care. As such, this could have contributed to the skew in SAEs towards the ambulatory care group. What about secondary spontaneous pneumothorax? Let's look at the BTS and ACCP guidelines. BTS recommends that all secondary spontaneous pneumos should be hospitalized and most will require a small bore chest drain. The ACCP guidelines are similar, but also suggest that stable patients with small pneumothoraces may potentially be observed without intervention whilst hospitalized. ACCP also does not recommend aspiration, whereas the BTS guidelines suggest that small pneumothoraces may be aspirated. And just to highlight the differences between management of primary versus secondary spontaneous pneumothorax are because in secondary pneumothoraces, these are well less tolerated due to underlying lung disease, and also because the air leak is less likely to resolve spontaneously. If all else fails, we may need to refer to thoracic surgeons in cases where there are second, uh, second uh, ischilateral pneumothorax, or if there is a first contralateral pneumothorax, the first occurrence of a secondary pneumothorax, bilateral spontaneous pneumothorax, if there is a persistent air leak more than three to five days, spontaneous hemothorax, or if the patient is in a profession at risk, such as a pilot or diver. And surgery generally involves black or blectomy, as well as pleurodesis. So what do we do if we have a persistent air leak and the patient is not a surgical candidate? We now have autologous blood patch, and this can be considered in patients who have a persistent air leak who are not surgical candidates. The amount to use is approximately one mil per kg per installation in this protocol published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery back in 2012. Venous blood is drawn from the patient without addition of anticoagulants. The autologous blood is then instilled and flushed to prevent clotting. The chest tube is then clamped and tubing kept above the level of the chest to prevent any backflow. And the chest tube is kept clamped until the patient felt breathless at which point it was released. And this protocol allows up to three blood patches at 48 hour intervals. Okay, so now you see the one way and the bronchial valves. These are inserted at bronchoscopy to occlude the relevant lung segment. And in order to identify the source of air leaks, a Fogarty catheter can be inserted into the lobar bronchus suspected of supplying the air leak. The catheter balloon is then inflated and the air leak rate is assessed through the chest tube a couple of minutes later. If the air leak is reduced, the procedure is repeated in each individual segment in order to identify the exact source of air leak. If more than one segment is identified with an air leak, the primary segment of supplying the leak is treated first. So earlier you saw the airway being sized up with a blue diameter gauge for a quick visual assessment of the bronchial diameter. And this is now followed by deployment of the fish mouth one-way valve as you can see, like, look like a fish, which will occlude the relevant lung segment. Okay, and just to conclude, here are some take-home messages. Essentially, management should depend on clinical symptoms rather than the size of the pneumothorax. Also, when drainage of air is required, simple aspiration may be considered first, bearing in mind a 25 to 50% failure rate. Ambulatory management should be considered in PSP, and a more cautious approach in secondary pneumothorax is required because these patients are more likely to be symptomatic with underlying lung disease. Non-surgical options for persistent air leak include Heimlich or one-way valves, autologous blood patch, as well as endobronchial valves. And last but not least, shared decision-making with the well-informed patient is really at the center of personalized pneumothorax management. And here I leave you with a picture of the indoor waterfall at the Jewel Airport in Singapore, and I hope you will be able to come to visit us once the pandemic fades. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kerry Leong, for that uh, excellent lecture, uh, for updating uh, us on the management of pneumothorax. So we'll move to next uh, uh, lecture. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Najib Rahman. Uh,
he is going to uh, deliver a lecture on management of plural diseases in 2020, applying the evidence. Professor Najib Rahman is a professor of respiratory medicine, lead for plural diseases, director of Oxford Respiratory Trials Unit at the University of Oxford. He was qualified in Oxford and underwent medical SHO rotations at Queen's Medical Center, Nottingham, and rejoined Oxford as a specialist registrar in 2003. He undertook a DPhil and MSc in this period and was appointed a senior lecturer and director of the Oxford Respiratory Trials Unit, consultant and lead, lead for plural diseases in Oxford in 2011. He was appointed as associate professor in 2014 and professor of respiratory medicine in 2018. He is currently involved in many randomized and observational studies in plural infection, pneumothorax, and malignant plural effusion interventions. He has published over 180 papers with citations over more than 6,000. So Professor uh, Najib Rahman is going to uh, deliver the lecture on management of plural disease in 2020, applying the evidence. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and a huge thank you to the Sri Lankan College of Pulmonologists and the Kandy Medical Society. It's an honor uh, to be here and be participating in this webinar. Um, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so uh, this is uh, the subject of my talk. So we'll first very briefly talk about guidelines. And then we'll look at whether there's any evidence of new data in these areas. Now, because of the two previous excellent talks that have come before me, I will not be talking about investigation of pleural effusion nor of pneumothorax. This has been very thoroughly covered in the last two talks. So we'll concentrate today on management of malignant effusion and management of pleural infection. And what I will try to do is to demonstrate where there is new evidence and how that might impact upon our current understanding and indeed the current guidelines. So um, my two previous speakers have made reference to this document. This is the BTS Plural Guidelines 2010. I was involved in writing these guidelines. Um, they are now 10 years old. The question then comes whether we need a new guideline. So we did pretty hard work on this guideline. 19,000 abstracts, 2,000 papers reviewed, 1,400 papers double scored. Do we need another guideline? And I think the answer is we definitely do. And the reason is the amount of high quality data that has been published since this guideline came about. And that's what I will take you through over the next 20 minutes or so. So let's start with malignant pleural effusion. All of you are thoroughly familiar with the disease entity. Uh, on my screen here, you can see a large pleural effusion, atelectatic lung, nodular pleural thickening. And this is the patient's um, thoracoscopy showing nodules of tumor, pleural plaques. And this was uh, a case of mesothelioma. So what's changed in this particular disease area? Well, let's start with the BTS guidelines 2010. And I'm gonna go through this in some detail so that we can look at which areas need an update given the new evidence. So the BTS guidelines start with a symptomatic pleural effusion. And the first question is, is it symptomatic? If it is not, then the BTS 2010 guidelines suggest we should observe. I think that is still the case currently, except there is increasing and gathering data that the presence of pleural fluid itself, even if asymptomatic, may result in worse outcomes. We don't have certain data yet, but this is an area to watch in the future. The BTS guidelines suggest that this is referred to respiratory medicine as a UK specific guideline, and then immediately a large volume pleural aspiration is conducted. In patients then who have a decent prognosis, so not in those with a small, uh, a low prognosis, aspiration only is required. And I guess the new um, piece of information in the last 10 years is we now have two prognostic scores in malignant pleural effusion. Uh, one is the LENT score, the uh, other is the PROMISE score, one conducted by my unit, the other conducted by the Bristol unit. So you now have two reliable ways of predicting prognosis that might help you to categorize patients into this category. Now, the, the current guidelines suggest that we immediately divide patients if they're of good prognosis with a symptomatic malignant effusion into patients who have a trapped lung or not. And the subsequent intervention depends entirely on whether their lung is trapped. If they are trapped, it suggests that we should go for an indwelling pleural catheter. 
if they are not trapped, then it suggests that pleuridesis is the best way to do this, either with thoracoscopy or an intercostal chest tube. And so in this schema, pleuridesis is considered the first line treatment and indwelling pleural catheters very much considered the second line treatment. So let's look at a few of these aspects one by one. So trap lung, first of all, effusion is considered ideal. So, um, sorry, pleuridesis is considered ideal. And therefore, we should ask the question, what constitutes optimal pleuridesis? Before we head off towards knowing that we should do a pleuridesis, we should know how to best conduct a pleuridesis. So let's discuss that, first of all. And this paper, I think, helps us to understand what optimal medical pleuridesis looks like. So this was the time one randomized trial. Uh, we conducted this study um, in about 20 UK centres. It was a randomised study of 330 patients. Let me explain the rationale and then the results. So our purpose in this study was to ask the question, what is optimal, meaning the best outcome for the patient, but the least pain in a patient with malignant pleural effusion undergoing talc pleuridesis? So first of all, we know that pleuridesis is painful. 60% of patients report moderate pain despite using opiates and the majority of us use opiates. So despite our use of heavy opiate, at least or more than half of the patients are in significant pain. This is a data table from our consultant colleagues in anesthesiology. And what they have done is a thousands and thousands of patients have gone into studies where they have looked at what the most effective analgesic is. And what they come up with by using the same methodology, so that's a placebo-controlled trial of acute pain, in which they use the same outcome, which is a measurement of pain as rated by the patient. By using the same methodology, we are able to list all of the analgesics in order of how effective they are. And we come up with this central number. That's the number needed to treat. Now, what does that mean? It means the number of patients you need to treat with a certain analgesic in order to reduce their pain by half. And therefore, the lower the number needed to treat, the more effective the painkiller. And what I would point out immediately is that the first four or five are all high dose non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, every single one of them. And our friend, morphine, which we use liberally in respiratory medicine and for pleuridesis, is all the way down here. So this would immediately suggest that for a painful condition such as pleuridesis, we should be using ibuprofen or something similar. But there's a problem with that, which is that all of us are taught in our training, I certainly was, that non impair pleuridesis. When we looked into this issue, we found there was not a single piece of published human data to back up this statement. There are three animal studies from memory, two of them in rats, one of them in cats, in which they demonstrated with very large doses of non that with experimental pleuridesis, there was a reduction in histological pleuridesis score. So this leads us to think maybe we are avoiding the most effective analgesic, non in malignant pleural effusion on the basis of loose data. So that's fact number one. Now, the second area is what size of chest tube should you be using for your malignant pleural effusion pleuridesis? This is a surgical drain, so to speak, 24 French. This is uh, known as a guide wire or pigtail drain. This is a 12 French drain. There is only one comparative study in the literature. It's a, a randomized study by Clementson in which they contain large and small bore tubes. And it was an 18 patient study, very small, and it was a negative study. And the authors, Clements and et al, concluded that there was no difference between a large bore tube and a small bore tube. But you will all appreciate that the methodology was incorrect. So this is a negative superiority study, not a positive non-inferiority study. And if you look at the confidence interval for the pleuridesis rate with a smaller tube in their own study, it was anywhere between 20% success and 80% success. And this is a wide confidence interval and therefore really tells us nothing about whether a large bore tube is better than a small bore tube. Now, this is a quote from the 2010 guidelines. In the 2010 guidelines, we said that we should use a small bore tube, despite the fact that large bore tubes were used in most of the studies that justified the use of talc. And therefore, when we quote to our patients, talc has a 70, 80% success rate, you and I are quoting universally studies that used a large bore tube. And yet we made this erroneous conclusion from the Clementson study that a small bore tube was just as good. 
So in the time one study, we set out to answer these two questions. And just to explain the methodology, we took patients with a malignant pleural effusion, we randomized them in what's called a two by two factorial design. This means that we are randomizing them twice, once on the first layer to a large bore tube or a small bore tube. And then secondly, the same patient is randomized to either non-steroidal or opiate. And in this way, we hoped to answer two questions at the same time. One, which analgesia is optimal? And two, which drain size is optimal? And we had two primary outcome measures. The first was pain to answer the pain question, obviously. And the second was pleurodesis success at one month and three months in a non-inferiority design with all patients undergoing standardized analgesia sedation, otherwise during the pleurodesis. And this is what we found. So this is the pain score. I'll just explain the graph a little bit. This is time since the tube was inserted in hours. So eight hours all the way up to 140 hours. And this is the pain score. Zero is no pain at all. 100, which is missing from the graph, is the worst pain ever possible. And what you can see immediately is in the first eight hours after pleurodesis, non is in fact superior to the opiate, exactly what we would predict from our anesthesiology randomized literature. However, over time, they become very similar. So overall, there was really no benefit of using non over opiate or opiate over non except for in that first eight hours after pleurodesis. And this is the pain score for large bore tube in blue versus small bore tube in orange. And you can see that the large bore tube is consistently more painful than the small bore tube all the way through treatment, exactly what you would predict, a larger tube is more painful. However, when we analyze the data in terms of the amount of pain prevented by the large bore tube, statistically it was significant, but clinically it was not significant. The difference was only six millimeters on the VAS score, and the minimum clinically significant difference in the VAS score is 18 or 19 millimeters. So statistically it's more painful, clinically it's probably not relevant. Now let's ask the pleurodesis question. So firstly, this is the first ever prospective human data looking at non in preventing pleurodesis. What do we find? This is a Kaplan-Meier graph over time. This is three months and six months. And this is the percentage pleurodesis failure. You can see that the two graphs cross each other all the time, suggesting that there is no detriment to using non for your pleurodesis success. I should be very clear that the non were only given in the first few days just after they had the pleurodesis and not subsequently, but the pleurodesis success rate at three months was identical, 80%, and at six months, about 78%. So non are here proven not to reduce your pleurodesis success rate. Now, what about the same analysis by chest tube? And this was a surprise to all of us. You can see right from the beginning, the 12 French tube is associated with a reduction in pleurodesis success, meaning that at three months, Using a small bore tube, your success rate is 70%, and using a large bore tube, it's more like 78 or 80%. And although I have been advocating small bore tubes for many years, I have been arguing with surgeons for many years that small bore is just as good as a large bore. In fact, I was wrong. And for this particular indication, a large bore tube is more effective for talc pleur pleurodesis. Now, you might say that that's because the small bore tube is gets blocked more quickly or for example the small bore tube has other advantages we expected that the pigtail tubes were safer in some way than the large bore tubes and again we were wrong so if you look at complications on tube insertion this was everything from bleeding to vasovagal to organ laceration there was a higher proportion of problems using the small bore tube 24 percent versus the large bore tube only 14 percent now that didn't reach statistical significance but if you looked at the number of tubes that fell out, we define this as falling out before a clinical decision was made to remove them, there was a massive difference. So 42% of the 12 French drains fell out versus only 28% of the large bore tubes. And this was statistically significant. So it would appear that the small bore tube is more dangerous and falls out more often. So what can we conclude? non can be safely used in pleurodesis, and we were using high doses here, 800 milligrams TDS. Smaller drains are less painful, but this does not reach clinical significance. It's statistically significant, but not clinically significant, meaning there is a difference, but it is minuscule. 
the 12th French strain does not meet non-inferiority, meaning a 24 French strain is preferable for pleuridesis, and 12 French strains have increased complications and tend to fall out more often. So what then is optimal current pleuridesis? I think you should use a large bore drain greater than 20 French. You can use non-steroidals or opiate or a combination depending on your patient population. And for those advocates of smaller bore drains, I would ask the question on the basis of this data, what is the advantage of a smaller bore drain? Well, there isn't one. It is slightly less painful, but it's not clinically significant. It is less safe. Um, I didn't show you this data, but they get blocked more often and the fallout rate is higher. So I think we have now defined optimal talc pleuresis. Let's go back to our um, guideline. So what's the next question we have? The, in the guideline, it suggests that you can use either poudrage or you can use slurry. So this has been a long debate in the plural world. What should you do? This is a talc poudrage pleuridesis system at thoracoscopy. It's a very satisfying procedure to do. One uses a rigid instrument or a flexible instrument to spray the talc, making a nice layer over the dry pleura. And we've been told for many years that this geographic distribution and the dry pleura mean that the talc pleuridesis will be successful much more so than doing it at the bedside uh, with a slurry. Is that true? Well, there's three bits of evidence that we need to consider. One is this network meta-analysis done by my colleagues in um, Bristol, Nick Maskell and Millie Clive. Uh, this was a huge piece of work updated from about five years ago in which they looked at every randomized trial looking at interventions for malignant pleural effusion. And the headline was this. So uh, the, the methodology of this network meta-analysis is that you find what the most highly ranked pleuridesis agents are from highest to lowest, and you'll see immediately that talc poudrage rates as one of the absolute highest and had one of the greatest bulk of evidence, talc slurry was behind it. So certainly from this network meta-analysis, you would say that talc poudrage is more effective and should be the one that is used. This is the paper on which most people base that data. So this is the Dresler paper, I would point out published in 2005, so now 15 years ago. And this was a surgical paper randomizing patients to poudrage versus slurry. This is their pleuridesis success rate and survival. And you can see no difference between the two. So a negative study, but the authors then used a subgroup analysis methodology, which you shouldn't do, but they did it anyway, looking at lung cancer and breast cancer. Here, the difference started to be statistically significant favoring poudrage. And then in those patients without trapped lung with lung and breast cancer, there was a 20% difference, statistically significant, again, favoring poudrage, a much higher success rate here than here. So uh, there were certain methodological problems with this study. I'll just go back a slide and demonstrate one of the main methodological problems. Their primary outcome was 90 days. And if you look at the numbers needed, uh, the number of patients at risk over this period, the majority of patients sadly had been lost to follow up or had died by 66, by 90 days, only 66 out of 220. And this meant that the analysis was perhaps not as efficient as it could have been. So we have since myself uh, and Nick Maskell uh, in Bristol, he led this work as did Rahul Batnagar. This has since been repeated in what we call the TAPS study. And this was essentially trying to do the Dresler study but a little bit more methodologically accurate. What did we do? We took patients with malignant pleural effusion. We randomized them one-to-one -to, -one to either a 10 to 14 French Seldinger chest strain or medical thoracoscopy with a six month follow-up, including patients who had a high likelihood of surviving a decent amount of time. The primary outcome was pleuridesis failure at three months. And this is what we found. So there is, again, no advantage to talc poudrage versus talc slurry. You might think that this is a small advantage, but in fact, in Kaplan-Meier analysis, if the curves cross over multiple times, the st uh, statistically, this is not significant. And there was really no advantage to talc slurry over poudrage or the other way around. So what do we conclude about poudrage? Well, we now have two randomized trials, Dresler and the TAP study, that show no benefit of poudrage whatsoever. I think you should not use poudrage preferentially over slurry if you have the option for both. Now, having said that, during thoracoscopy, if one is taking biopsies and one wishes to do a poudrage, it's perfectly legitimate to do so, and in fact, a good thing to do so. 
But if a patient has a diagnosed malignant effusion, should we be pushing them towards having a poudrage if they don't need a biopsy? I don't think that's justified. It is more expensive and more invasive and associated with no advantages. Okay, so we've answered the question about poudrage. We've answered the question about ideal pleuronesis. What about this thorny issue? At the minute in the BTS guidelines, the suggestion is that we should use pleuronesis as the first line treatment and IPC only in selected patients. Can we use IPC first line? And we now have two randomized trials that answer this question. The first is the TIME2 trial. This is published some years ago by my colleague Helen Davis in 2012. What did we do in this study? We randomized patients who were first presentations of malignant effusion, and we randomized them either to an indwelling pleural catheter. This is a home drainage system. Patients are implanted as a, as a day case. They're sent home and they drain regularly at home, either with their family or with nursing support, or a 12th French drain and a pleuridesis. So one-to-one -one randomization of the first intervention for malignant pleural effusion. And what we were looking for in this study was which of these was better at a patient-centered outcome measure. So the outcome measure we used was breathlessness measured by 100 millimeter scores over a six week period. And what's the answer? Well, this is the primary outcome slide. This is mean breathlessness over six weeks, 42 days on a 100 millimeter scale. And you can see that the mean breathlessness in the talc group and the IPC group was identical comparing the to patient populations. So there was really no difference in their breathlessness scores, whether we use talc or indwelling pleural catheter. I would point out that when we started the intervention, their average breathlessness was just over 70 millimeters. And therefore, whatever you do or I do, we are making the patients much better, which is very satisfying. But really, we couldn't say that one was much superior to the other. This was a negative superiority trial. If we looked at some of the secondary outcomes, and it's important to point out that these were secondary, this was hospital stay, time in hospital over a year, and the need for further invasive pleural procedures, then there was an advantage to the indwelling pleural catheter. So the IPC saved three and a half days in hospital. That is expected because they go home straight away. That is continued all the way up to 12 months, and it significantly reduces the number of patients who need another pleural procedure. An odds ratio of 0.21, you would expect that because around 20% of patients in the talc group are obviously going to fail and need a further pleural procedure. And all of these were statistically significant. Okay, so in these secondary outcomes, the IPC is superior. We're happy with that. However, in terms of adverse events, the, adver the IPC was worse and it was significantly worse. Odds ratio of 4.7, statistically very significant. Most of these adverse events were related to skin or pleural infection, as you would expect, of course, because the IPC patients were being sent home with a catheter. So you are buying these advantages with this disadvantage. But there was no significant difference in quality of life. Now, since we conducted the time to study, this has been repeated, pretty much the same methodology by my colleagues in Australia, Gary Lee, and Rajesh Thomas leading this, this they called the AMPLE trial. It was the same randomization and methodology. Their primary outcome, however, was hospital stay until death or at 12 month follow-up. And they demonstrated pretty much the same as we did, a two or three day difference between IPC and pleuridesis. So we now have two randomized trials that have shown us the same result, slightly different primary outcome measures, and the breathlessness score was the same between the two. What this tells us then is that the IPC is a very valid first line treatment for patients with malignant pleural effusion. But we can't say that they're superior. Although they are the new technology, people are excited. They're certainly not better. Both of them improve what we care about, breathlessness, quality of life and chest pain. IPCs reduce hospital stay, reduce pleural procedures, but at the risk of increased adverse events. Now I've stated here that they reduce further pleural procedures let me just criticize my own data. I think we use the wrong outcome here. When we say they reduce further pleural procedures, we mean that they come less often to see the physician for another pleural procedure. But are, they, are the patients truly having less pleural procedures? To my mind, the patient with the IPC is in fact having three pleural procedures every week by draining their own chest. And so we started to become interested in what their normal experience of having an IPC was. And this is a piece of work done by Rochelle Ashiak, published in Chester a couple of years ago. 
in it, we took 180 of our patients treated with an IPC and we looked at what they did over the period of their life with the IPC. And one in three require a further review because of a problem with the IPC and the median number of home drainages is nearly 100. This is not the same as no further plural procedures and further studies need to look carefully at the patient experience. Okay, very quickly, can we improve IPC treatment? Well, there are two possible ways. One is by optimizing the drainage frequency of the patients at home, and the second is to give talc via the IPC. Now, I'll buzz through this fairly quickly. There are two randomized trials, the first being ASAP, conducted by my colleague Momin Wahidi from Duke in USA. And here, they compared aggressive drainage every day to every other day drainage with an IPC, looking for the incidence of autopleuridesis. And they proved very nicely that aggressive drainage doubled your pleuridesis rate. Six weeks, around 20% to around 45%. So if you're going to use an IPC and you want to achieve pleuridesis, daily drainage is better. And this has been repeated uh, by the Australian group. Um, so this was the AMPLE2 study. Again, pretty much the same methodology uh, as the ASAP study, and they showed exactly the same thing. So again, around 10, 15% positive at 90 days versus around 40% positive. But they did find, which was different to the ASAP trial, that aggressive drainage was associated with slightly less breathlessness. So about 16 millimeters versus about 21, 22 millimeters. Again, not clinically significant, but there was an early signal that that might be helpful. And then we have this study again by the Bristol group published in the New England Journal. And this was talc given via the IPC, the IPC plus study published last year. In it, we took patients, 154, who had an indwelling catheter in. They had to be um, screened first, regularly drained to show that they had an expandable lung. And if they had an expandable lung, they were then assigned to either placebo into the catheter or talc and we looked at their pleuridesis rates. Now, importantly, this means that this patient was a selected patient group. So they actively removed anybody who had a trapped lung or those who didn't have fully expansile lung. And that's important when we look at the conclusions. And what they found was a very clear signal positive towards talc. So at the five weeks outcome point, which is their primary outcome point, there was a 20% pleuridesis rate in the placebo group versus again, a roughly 40% rate in the talc group. So very satisfying, very positive. What does that mean? Well, let me summarize those three studies by saying, if an IPC is used, then probably one should manage it actively, i.e. either daily drainage or adding talc, and this results in higher pleuridesis rates. But there are some unanswered questions. Why are we doing it? Is it for pleuridesis or symptom control? And the cost, meaning the monetary cost, and the cost of the patients not quite understood as yet. Now, some people have said the IPC plus study, which I was involved in, means that we do not have to use talc as an inpatient anymore. Is that true? Well, I think it is absolutely not true. What I've done here is to present the Kaplan myographs for the IPC study and for the time one study. And if we look at the same outcome point, which is 10 weeks, you can see here 10 weeks, roughly three months or so, the pleuridesis success rate with IPC and talc is about 50%. And at the same outcome point with inpatient pleuridesis, it is more like 80%. And therefore, the most efficient way of achieving a pleuridesis, it remains inpatient pleuridesis. So I think talc through the IPC is an option if you use an IPC. But if a patient wants a pleuridesis, the best way to achieve this is with inpatient care. Now, how do you make the decision of IPC or talc? Well, the data is balanced. I use IPCs if the lung is trapped. If they have expandable lung, it's patient choice according to whether they want in or out patient. But I suggest the IPC is likely to be lifelong treatment in my consent process. OK, so let's move on in my last uh, eight minutes or so towards pleural infection. Uh, these are three representative pictures of pleural infection, chest X-ray, thoracoscopic view and a CT scan that's already been discussed. I'm gonna look at two particular aspects. One is interventional treatment, the other is microbiology. We've already heard that microbiology yield is poor, only 40% and therefore empirical therapy is required. My colleague has already discussed this study, the blood culture bottle study, and rendering fluid in the blood culture bottle study results in about 20%, that's in the black here, 20% increased yield 
in pleural infection. So this should be standard care, sending even a few mils of pleural fluid in the back tech system, which is probably in use in your hospitals already. Now I have the question whether we're looking in the right place. So this is a pleural biopsy demonstrating granuloma and tuberculosis. If you ask the tubercle, where does he like to hang out? He likes to hang out in the pleural lining in the parietal pleura, not in the fluid. And yet with standard bacterial pleural infection, you and I send the fluid to the lab, but we don't send a pleural biopsy. So we ask the question, is it possible to increase our diagnostic yield by doing an image guided cutting needle biopsy while inserting a chest tube for a septated effusion from infection? And that was this study, the audio study. And what we showed was that pleural blood cultures had a 10% diagnostic yield. Pleural fluid in this study, very small study, only 25 patients had a 20% diagnostic yield but pleural biopsy, that nearly doubled, more than doubled the diagnostic yield to nearly 50%. And this was a largely pre-treated with antibiotic population. So it does seem to work. And on the histology, we demonstrated an inflammatory inf infiltrate and little nests of bacteria within the pleura. So this looks like an exciting possibility for the future. Pleural biopsy will help us to diagnose pleural infection. Now let's talk about intrapleural treatment. So this is an ultrasound, you're all familiar with this. Here is my guide needle going through septated um, areas into the largest pocket of pleural fluid. We then feed in a 12 French catheter and using agitated saline, we can demonstrate the bubbles moving within one locule but not communicating with the other locules. And from here comes the idea that loculated fluid will drain poorly and give us difficulty. From this idea came the MIST-1 study and several other studies before, but the MIST-1 study is the largest, most definitive study in this area. In it, um, my um, colleague Nick Maskell and Rob Davis, my predecessor, predecessor, used streptokinase to try to disrupt the fibrinous septations against placebo, randomized, double-blind, really well-conducted study that was completely and entirely negative, regardless of what outcome was chosen, uh, whether it was need for surgery, mortality, recovery from hospital, length of hospital stay, completely negative study. Now, there were several biological reasons to believe that streptokinase had poor availability within the pleural space. Maybe a fibrinolytic alone is not sufficient, and we therefore conducted this study. So this was the MIST-2 study looking at TPA and DNAs, both, or, it, it, both placebo in combination or individual agents in pleural infection. So 210 patient randomized study in 10 UK hospitals. This was the primary outcome, which was the percentage improvement in the amount of pleural shadowing measured with a digital system. So a very objective, hard outcome that was a continuous variable. And what we found was this. So just to explain the graph, zero means no change over seven days of treatment. So this patient, for example, there was no difference between the pre and post treatment x-ray over seven days. This patient had an increase in their pleural shadowing of nearly 90%. So this was definitely treatment failure, whereas this patient had a complete clearance of their chest X-ray. What you notice straight away is that placebo does partially clear some of the shadowing, about 30%. TPA on its own, the same. So this is exactly the same result as the MIST-1 study. TPA has no effect above placebo. DNAs alone, exactly the same. But if you put the two together, you double the drainage and the majority of patients having TPA DNAs together completely cleared their chest X-ray. So a very interesting study result. Now, who cares about the chest X-ray? Well, what about the secondary outcomes? If we looked at surgical referral and hospital stay, only TPA DNAs significantly reduced surgical referral by a large amount and significantly reduced hospital stay. So should we now be using this stuff? Well, we know that it improves the chest X-ray. It strongly suggests it improves other parameters, but I don't think we yet have enough data to use it in every patient. So where do we use it? We use it where there are no other treatment op options available. We refer young fit patients to surgery for an intervention. If they are waiting for their surgery, then we use TPA DNAs and we use it as part of the clinical trial as well. However, not everybody feels the same. And these are colleagues in Australia who have used it in 107 patients. They here claim that it had a 92% success rate and it's safe and effective as rescue therapy. So this is a larger case series, but it's not comparative. And therefore maybe these patients were getting better anyway. And if I looked at the world literature, which I did this search just last week, 
uh, on TPA DNAs, and there are now 637 cases of TPA and DNAs reported all in case series, all with a high amount of success. So I think it's probably entered standard treatment now. There are alternatives to the MIST drugs. The MIST2 drugs are expensive. They cost about £1,500 in the UK, so they're very expensive. This is a small study done by the Bristol Group looking at plural irrigation. Only 35 patients, but they used sterile saline, 250 milligrams three times a day through a single small bore tube. And what they demonstrated, this is the, this is the number of patients who needed um, surgery and in, in uh, white and the number who didn't in black. And you can see in the control group, it was about 50-50 with irrigation, rapidly uh, a huge reduction in the number of patients requiring surgery. Now, there are some methodological problems here. One is that the control group surgical rate is extremely high, 50%, not as high as other placebo controlled studies, but nonetheless, this is an alternative. And then finally, what about medical thoracoscopy? Our surgical colleague will speak next, but can we use medical thoracoscopy? This is me uh, dissecting adhesions in an infected malignant space and unifying the space. This seems like a possible good option. There is case series evidence to support this from Britscher, who was uh, in uh, Switzerland. They did 127 patient retrospective review the patients were selected according to ultrasound septation, and they claim 91% treatment success rate and a 6% surgical rate. Sounds very convincing, but if you look a bit deeper into the data, it's not that convincing because 50% of them required another treatment and 5% of them required another thoracoscopy. So at the minute, the jury is out on the use of medical thoracoscopy. I will say as a medical thoracoscopist that I do not use medical thoracoscopy in plural infection. In my view, if a patient has failed physician treatment, we should simply uh, hand them on to our surgeons who have much broader skills in this area, including being able to decorticate the lung and control problems such as air leak and bleeding. Um, we are, however, doing this study now. This is the MIST-3 study led by my colleague Ehab Badawi, and we are randomizing patients to VATS, standard care, or DNA's TPA. This is about one quarter recruited, and we should be able to publish the results sometimes next year, which is the first direct comparison of VATS and TPA DNA's in this area. So just finally, just to increase the excitement, there are large numbers of recent and ongoing plural trials. This is all of them listed in the last 10 years. So there's a massive amount of observational and randomized studies going on in plural disease, an exciting time uh, to be in plural medicine. I must thank uh, all of my collaborators and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Rahman, for uh, a great lecture, which shed a lot of light uh, and gave a valuable insight into what we have been doing for the last decade. Uh, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker, uh, is uh, Dr. Dammika Rasnayaka. Uh, and uh, Dammika currently working as a consultant thoracic surgeon at National Hospital of for Respiratory Diseases at Palisar. He obtained his MBBS degree from University of Peradinia, uh, MD surgery from University of Colombo, and MRCS from Royal College of Surgeons, England. Completed fellowship in advanced uh, minimal invasive thoracic surgery at Liverpool Heart and just hospital, had a postgraduate training in Oxford University Hospital, Oxford, UK. His main interests are advanced minimally invasive lung cancer surgeries, including video assisted thoracoscopic surgery and video assisted medicinal uh, lymphadenectomy, advanced airway surgeries, including palliative endobronchial tumor resection, minimally invasive esophageal surgeries, life saving emergency airway injury management, chest trauma management, including chest wall reconstruction. Pediatric thoracic surgery. Uh, I invite Dr. Damika Rasnayaka for his lecture. Good afternoon, everyone. And I should thank Kendra Society of Medicine as well as College of Palm Sri Lanka College of Palmologists for inviting me for this lecture. I think you can see my slide. Today I'm going to talk surgeon's role in management of plural diseases. Today I'm going to highlight, elaborate on malignant plural effusion and oncothorax, empyema thorax, and TB empyema and empyema associated with aspergillosis. 
but most of them have already uh, elaborated by my colleague, Dr. Professor Nash. But anyway, I'm going to highlight rest of the things. As you all know, malignant pleural effusion is the pleural effusion due to the infiltration of malignant cells in visceral and parietal pleura. And at that time, it is advanced disease because there is distant metastasis. So their median survival is very low. So treatment is main, treatment goal is mainly palliative. Then I just want to highlight in early stage of malignant pleural effusion, it is non-loculated and free-flowing and can manage with thoracocentesis or pleural disease easily because lung is expandable. On the other hand, the, there's a challenge at latter part. That is, lung, there's lung entrapment causing oncothorax. That is mainly due to infiltration of the visceral pleura by the cancer cell, as well as associated fibrosis causing collapsed lung or trapped lung. At the same time, there's infiltration of the visceral parietal pleura as well as fibrosis will lead to reduced respiratory mechanics due to the fibrous ring over the chest wall. So it will associate with increased VQ mismatch. As my colleague explained earlier, we can do pleural disease for early stage malignant pleural effusion, but for late stage, surgical intervention is necessary. This is one, uh, one of the patient who had adenocarcinoma. And you can see the, on this chest X-ray, even after drainage with chest drain tube, there is a collapsed right lung with thickened visceral pleura as well as there is thickened parietal pleura. On CT chest, it is more detailed. You can see with high resolution image, the very thick visceral pleura and thickened parietal pleura with significant pleural space. And this lung is trapped. Not only that, with CT scan, you can find out the segments of lung involved and the lung parenchymal involvement. Basically, in the diagnosis, you can do thoracosynthesis and get the cytology and get the, come to a diagnosis. In addition to that, thoracoscopy and biopsy is the ideal investigation of choice. Following diagnosis of malignant pleural effusion, these are the treatment options. Thoracocentesis for patient uh, who has low life expectancy, as well as then pleural disease and indwelling pleural catheters, pleuroperitone shunts, and decortication, and even hypothermic chemoperfusion. Thoracosynthesis is considered in low rigor accumulation type of pleural effusion and short patient with short life, life expectancy. I don't go into detail because my colleague has already described about these things. And pleural disease for malignant pleural effusions also. I'm not going. All the of every kind of chemical pleurodesis agent and uh, about talc, you know everything now. And this is, this one also elaborated by, by my colleague, Professor Nash. And this is regarding efficiency of talc slurry and talc powderage. There's other thing. What is the ideal tube duration after pleural disease? 
Some people say it is 24 hours. Some people say it is 72 hours. But I know most of the people practice 72 hours, I think, including myself. But according to this study, they have found out there is no significant difference of outcome in 30 days. As Professor Naj explained, malignant pleural effusion is successfully managed by indwelling pleural catheters. I'm not going to elaborate this thing further because it was very detailed presentation. Earlier days, when there was indwelling pleural catheters was not available, they practiced pleuroperitoneal shunts. That was, there's a tube with one-way valve connected pleura into the peritoneum. This is a surgical procedure. By that mean, pleural fluid will drain into the peritoneum. The most important thing is healthy peritoneal cells will absorb all the pleural fluid and relieve the tension developed within the chest. And these kind of things are mainly for the entrapped lung, which you can't manage with pleural disease. And by this study, they have managed 160 patients from 1983 to 1998, and they have found 95% success in palliation. It significantly low mortality, but they have got a couple of complications like uh, repeated obstruction of the tube, as well as skin infection, skin erosion, and only very few patients has got peritoneal seedling of malignant cells. It is not commonly done nowadays. I think that that's mainly because of that availability of indwelling pleural catheters. Let's talk about malignant lung entrapment. That is called oncothorax. It's, a, it's always a challenge because these patients are debilitated. And both visceral and parietal pleura can be involved with tube infiltration. As I explained, they have diminished respiratory movements due to the thickened pleural drain underlying the chest wall as well over the parietal pleura, as well as thickened visceral pleura causing lung entrapment. It will affect the lung expansion and chest wall movements. How do you manage this? You have to release the entrapped lung by extensive decortication or peeling off of pleural peel. By doing that, you can release the lung and let it re-expand. Without doing that, you can't do pleural disease because that lung is very well away from the parietal pleura. At the same time, you have to do a detailed parietal pleurectomy to release the chest wall to re-establish its normal respiratory movement. This surgery can be done by thoracoscopically easily, but it is not useful in patients with limited life expectancy and patients with very poor condition. If the patient's condition is satisfactory and if the cancer is treatable or if they have significant life expectancy, we generally perform pleurectomy and decortication for uh, those patients with entrapped lung. Even this is a similar kind of treatment nowadays performed for malignant pleural mesothelioma. Even this study shows there's a better overall survival in patient with decortication as well as they have better progression-free survival. Oh, earlier days, malignant pleural mesothelioma was managed 
by extra plural demonectomy. But this has a much better outcome than extra plural pneumonectomy. When you consider the oncothorax or intra entrapped malignant plural diffusion, it's a challenge. But it will be more challenging if you get infected due to various iatrogenic procedures or even tube insertion or repeated drainage. That super infected and loculated malignant plural effusion can cause abscess formation and sepsis. Furthermore, most of these patients are immunosuppressed due to their oncological management because most of them already uh, undergone chemotherapeutic procedures and they may have low level of immunity. At the same time, their lung is very unlikely to re-expand during the decortication because one thing is the lung has significant insult due to this infection, as well as lung is already infiltrated by the malignant cells. So our treatment aim is to minimal decortication, to re-expand the preserved lung parenchyma. At the same time, they can have significant amount of air leaks due to bron bronchodural fistula, as well as they can have residual plural pocket or plural space. How do you cover these po pockets? Because if you do not cover these pockets, it will lead to recurrent infection. So your effort will be unsuccessful. So what we do is we generally pack these plural space with muscle flaps and omen flaps. This is one of my patient who had adenocarcinoma of the lung. And you can see this lung is collapsed and the pleural fluid is turbid and it is infected. You can see the visceral pleural how this, how bad this lung is affected. You can't decorticate this lung because if you try to peel off that pleural peel, it will damage the lung and it will lead to air leak. So other thing is, with this infection, anyway, it is very difficult to decorticate the lung because lung is very fragile. Uh, there's a small technical fault so I think uh, you may have to hang on for a short period until we uh, correct that uh, just uh, I think Dr. Rasnak has got disconnected, uh, uh, must be uh, internet failure or... We ask, until we establish the connection with Dr. Rasnayak, uh, we would like to go for a few question and answer session, a small question and answer session. Uh, I think doc, uh, Dr. my co-chair will uh, be asking the questions which we have received from the uh, listeners. Uh, 
uh, I, we have uh, received many questions uh, out of them. Uh, so there's a question. This is actually, I think uh, this should go to Dr. Afla. Uh, is there a prognostic benefit in aspiration to dryness in TB pleural effusion? Okay, thank you very much. Basically, uh, uh, diagnosing uh, after diagnosing TB pleural effusion, it's always recommended to start on antitubicular treatment. So the question here is, when it is a larger effusion, how we are going to uh, manage, uh, is it only going to be on with uh, antitubicular treatment? But uh, with our clinical uh, practice uh, experience, we know that it is always a challenge when you have a large effusion just to leave it out, thinking that uh, antitubicular treatment will be the best uh, uh, answer for that. So, uh, but we, uh, there are no randomized control studies or any evidence to suggest that uh, uh, draining, complete drainage is going to help uh, for the uh, uh, better outcome. However, uh, we know that leaving residual uh, fluid uh, for a long time will lead to uh, sometime a large fluid entrapment uh, in the pleural space will lead into trap lung in some instances where the surgeon will find uh, very difficult at the outset uh, to relieve or de decorticate. So in this context, the always that uh, uh, question is posed uh, whether we are going, to, the moment we are uh, diagnosing this large effusion with TB, whether we are going to uh, drain completely. So what we feel is, yes, uh, it is always better once the diagnosis is confirmed, uh, especially if you are having a, a, a histological diagnosis, I think it is always uh, better to drain uh, as much as you can and hoping that uh, antibiotic treatment will give uh, uh, the rest of the um, uh, inflammatory process will uh, be or infective process will be controlled. So there are no studies or evidence to prove that, however, if it is a mild effusion, yes, you don't have to do that because un, uh, any instrumentation will cause uh, further underlying lung parenchymal damage. Where we know that there is some, uh, there are evidence to suggest that underlying lung parenchymal involvement with uh, TB in addition to the TB uh, uh, infection. So uh, there is no. Uh, answer straight answer to tell that the complete uh, drainage is uh, the answer but however it is it can be uh, utilized as an option but at the end uh, after completion of the treatment or even after completion of the intensive phase you may have to get the surgeon's opinion uh, at which point we are going to decorticate since the decortication early decortication in tb effusion i'm sure the the surgeons will agree with me that uh, there is a lot of uh, vascularity and uh, the the complications rate uh, or even the surgeons do like to touch uh, in the early stage of uh, tb in pima or so on Thank you, uh, Dr. Afra Sadikin, uh, for that uh, answer. So I think uh, Dr. Damikrasnaika has come online now. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's ready for the continuation of the presentation. Yes, I'm extremely sorry for the technical uh, problem. I'm extremely sorry for the technical uh, problem. And here, this is, I was describing, this is a patient uh, who had malignant uh, adenocarcinoma. And you can see that how the visceral pleura and parietal pleura is involved. And so this, on top of that, there is an infection and we carefully decorticated this patient and ultimately uh, it is very difficult to decorticate because it's friable. And uh, we did extensive pleurectomy to relieve the chest wall and ultimately make a thoracostomy and left the patient for about a few weeks uh, to treat the infection. 
once we treat the infection, what we did was we I put a omental flap with the rectus abdominis flap. So this is how we can manage this kind of malignant uh, entrapped lung with associated with infection. Then I I will go to the, uh, the another topic that is hypothermic chemoperfusion. This is one of the latest method to manage malignant pleural effusion. What they do is they de de decorticate surgically and after that in the perfuse hypothermic platinum based chemotherapeutic agent into the pleural cavity for few hours to kill the residual malignant cell. And by that mean, it is successfully managed this patient and they can increase the median survival time and disease free survival time. So this is a meta-analysis of five articles and it shows there's significant improvement of median survival and disease free survival. This is the instrument used for hypothermic chemoperfusion your operated patient is connected to this machine with a tube while the patient is under general anesthetics and you perfuse the hypothermic chemotherapeutic agent into the pleural cavity. Now I'm going to talk about the surgical management of empyema thorax, but here also I should have to elaborate on a little bit because my friend has already uh, elaborated in detail uh, some of the uh, problems associated with empyema. Basically, empyema thorax is divided into three stages. One is paraneumonic effusion, stage one, and fibroparallel stage, stage two, and chronic organizing stage, or stage three. The diagnosis is very important because the rest of the treatment is mainly depending on the stage. In, the, in diagnosis, US ultrasound scan is very important because it confirms the presence of pleural fluid and estimate the volume. Not only that, it can differentiate the pleural fluid and pleural thickening. It is a real-time investigation in most of the guidelines and protocols by that mean can optimize the site of drainage and the therapeutic intervention. Not only that, it will prevent arterogenic complications as well. At the same time, computerized tomography is very important and it is the imaging investigation of choice. You can diagnose concomitant lung parenchymal problem with CT scan as well as you can assess the pleura, chest tube position, and presence, and the presence of endobronchial lesions as well. Then what about bronchoscopy? It is important to find obstructive lesions which predispose to the empyema maybe tumor or inhaled foreign bodies because there's an association of that kind of endobronchial obstruction with empyema. Bronchoscopy is recommended only when there is a mass or volume loss in the imaging. But on the other hand, preoperative bronchoscopy will help to facilitate the lung re-expansion after decortication. When I consider the surgical treatment, there are a few surgical treatment options for empyema. One is thoracocentesis and tube thoracostomy, intrapural fibrolysis, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, and thoracotomy and decortication. Actually, thoracocentesis is a diagnostic tool. It is important to differentiate simple effusion from complicated paraneumonic effusion. 
is there any role of repeated trocar synthesis no it is not an alternative for early batch drainage or uh, prevent stage migration of paraneumonic effusion and early empyema generally the tube thoracostomy is indicated for stage 1 disease but stage 2 and 3 empyema there's a demonstrable benefit in surgical debridement and decortication over the tube thoracostomy and i'm not going to talk about intrapleural has all related in detail about intrapleural fibrinolysis but you have to remember it is a effective rescue treatment modality not a definitive treatment what is video assisted thoracoscopic surgery for empyema this is a video assisted thoracoscopic photograph of empyema you can see there's a pleural fluid collection and this is parietal pleura and there's significant amount of parulent pleural debris our main aim of treatment is deprive the pleural cavity and achieve the lung reexpansion in the debridement of pleural cavity include drainage of all the fluid and breaking of all loculation and removal of all the pleural exudate and finally you have to peel off all the pleural feel over the visceral pleura and remove the cortex to let the lung to reexpand what are the advantages over the thoracotomy and decortication generally with video assisted thoracoscopic surgery you can reduce the operation time and reduce the post operative pain as well as reduce the chest tube duration and reduce the length of hospital stay and it is basically cosmetic as well and you can patient can return early to work and it is effective as open decortication in even stage 3 disease when you should refer to a surgeon actually it is individualized and subjective if your conservative method of management is not effective because if it is if the clinical symptoms are not improving and if your radiological improvements is not there then you should refer this patient to surgeon as early as possible because delay in surgical intervention has a significant impact on stage migration as well as quality of life currently thoracotomy for empyema is has a very limited use nowadays we do thoracotomy for chronic empyema with significant lung destruction it include tb pleural disease and tb empyema and empyema associated with aspergilloma particularly ruptured aspergilloma then what we do is we have to thoroughly debride the pleura and we have to peel off the unhealthy lung carefully and ultimately it will end up with significant number of bronchopleural fistulas in tb effusion and tb empyema as well as uh, as empyema associated aspergilloma so this is one of my patient who had empyema associated with ruptured aspergilloma and this is your fungal ball and ultimately what we did was we just peel off this pleural layer 
and let the lung expand it as much as possible. And still there was a significant gap in the pleura. So we covered this gap with uh, omentum and rectus abdominis muscle because it is, omentum is a very good vascularized pedicle to cover this kind of thing because it has high immune cells and high blood supply. It will help to heal these kind of cavities very quickly. It is same, in, same for the TBM pima associated with multiple bronchopleural fistulas and cavities. We can easily pack those cavities with omentum. In summary, plural disease should be managed in multidisciplinary approach. Oncothorax and infected oncothorax should be managed by a surgeon. Stage two and three empyemas can be managed successfully with VATS. Early surgical referral is vital to maintain quality of life and early, early recovery. TB empyemas and empyema associated with aspergillosis can treat effectively by the surgical means. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dhammik Rasnayak, for that excellent uh, presentation. Uh, actually, we are grateful to you, uh, your colleagues, and you always uh, help us when we are in trouble. So thank you again for that excellent presentation. So with that, uh, we have come to the uh, end of all four lectures. And uh, so we have some time for, uh, to allow uh, a few questions. Uh, so I will uh, ask uh, uh, questions uh, uh, depending on the time available. So I have a, a, a question on pneumothorax. I think this is uh, to Dr. Kerry Leong. Uh, is there any guidance on management of iatrogenic pneumothorax, drain or not to drain? Do we have any evidence to support use of uh, autologous blood patch in management of unresolving pneumothorax? There are two questions. Okay, I think I'll take the eotrogenic uh, pneumothorax first. So um, once again, looking at uh, the various uh, guidelines um, and also our, our own practice in our center, if the pneumothorax is small and the patient is asymptomatic, uh, then we will leave it, we will observe. Or if the patient is symptomatic, then we will opt for a small ball chest drain. And I assume uh, these eotrogenic pneumothoraces are most likely um, post uh, transthoracic needle aspiration biopsy uh, pneumothoraces, which are very commonly seen in our uh, hospital setting. And the second, uh, the second question about autologous blood patch. So um, there is one study which I showed uh, very briefly just now. Um, from the uh, Annals of uh, Thoracic Surgery in 2012. Uh, essentially, this study looked at secondary pneumothoraces in patients with COPD, and uh, they looked at 0 0.5, 1 mil, and 2 mil per kg of blood patch compared with saline. And uh, they found that blood patch was efficacious, and uh, the optimal dosage or the amount is actually 1 mil per kg. Thank you. Much. Uh, this question is to uh, Professor Rahman. Uh, again, there are two questions. Uh, what is your view with regards to the size of the chest drain to be used in the management of uh, infective pleural effusion? Number two, uh, indications of pleural disease apart from malignant pleural effusion. So thank you very much indeed. Two very good questions. Um, I think the data I presented on malignant effusion should be taken only as malignant effusion. And in this area, I have to agree with my colleague Damika and his surgical colleagues, a large bore tube is definitely better in that situation. For pleural infection, we have retrospective data that suggests a small bore tube, 12, 14 French, is just as good as a first treatment option in pleural infection. So there is really no strong evidence to suggest that if you have failed a small bore tube, you should upgrade to a large bore tube. In my view, if medical management has failed with a small bore tube, then you should move on to the next option, be that surgery or TPA DNAs. That's, that's very straightforward. Um, what was the second question, sorry? 
indications of uh, pleural disease apart from malignant pleural effusions? Uh, yes. Yeah, so that, I'm so, so sorry, I have a bad memory today. Um, excellent question. Uh, I, I think this is challenging. Uh, for malignant effusion, the data is very strong on pleuridesis. That's very straightforward. For non-malignant effusion, it is much more challenging. And indeed, the data is confined to case series. There's very few randomized data. And the case series are very variable. Some of them suggest that um, pleuridesis for benign effusion, such as heart failure or hepatic hydrothorax, has a much lower success rate. And I think the reason for that is the large volume of fluid production. Again, I think in this situation, some of my colleagues are running into trouble by using a lot of indwelling catheters, and that I would counsel against, because for a benign disease, which with potentially two or three years survival, to have a piece of plastic in the chest long term, I think is a real problem. So to be honest, we don't know what to do. In my practice, if a patient has a uh, particularly poor quality of life, has had more than five or six thoracentesis, then we then offer them pleuridesis, but there is not strong data to base that on. Thank you very much, Professor Rahman. Uh, there's another question to uh, Dr. Damika. Uh, uh, what, what are the uh, options available for persistent air leaks? Thank you very much, Tushara. Uh, actually, it is depending on the cause, particularly for pleural infections and mainly for uh, tuberculosis infections are the common cause for persistent air leak uh, in our country. And what we perform is we generally uh, that for that kind of bronchopleural fistulas, we can pack these things with vascularized muscle, muscle pedicle. That is a good option because particularly uh, chronic TBM pimas will lead to extensive, uh, extensive bronchopleural fistula formation and long-term uh, air leak. And ultimately they will have long-term uh, even pleurocutaneous fistulas due to the persistent tube. So what we do is, as same as I demonstrated there, we open thoracos uh, the chest wall as a thoracostomy and uh, let some time uh, to settle that infection. Finally, once the infection is settled, what we do is we pack the pleural space with viable and uh, vascularized muscle pedicle and sometimes momentum. Momentum is the best, but that's if the patient is thin and lean, it is very difficult to get a significant size momentum. So rectus abdominis is a very good flap and latissimus dosa is also a good flap. So we pack with that, uh, those muscle pedicles and we can manage this kind of air leak easily. Question, uh, it's a place of intrapleural talc in persisting air leak if the patient is not fit for surgery? Uh, basically, if the lung is not expandable, you can't use talc because that talc is to uh, adhere the pleura together. But if most of the time, this kind of air leaks are mainly due to uh, the pleural separation and persistent bronchopleural fistula and they are, they, those lungs are collapsed. So they need kind of uh, uh, decortication to re-expand the lung. And then following that, we, sh we sh should uh, do pleural disease. For that kind of patient, what we generally do is, if you can't anesthetize this patient, we do under local anesthetics, we do some kind of procedures under local anesthetics. We can perform it and uh, sometime, uh, even with sedatives and local anesthetics, we do flaps and just do the uh, bronchopleural fistula correction. Right. Thank you, Damika. Uh, so I think uh, because of the time constraints, we have to uh, stop the answer uh, question, question and answer session. So before concluding the session, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Damit Nandadeva, uh, the Joint Secretary of the Sri Lanka College of uh, Palmologists of Sri Lanka, to uh, give the concluding remarks. 
Uh, right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tushar Galabete. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd first like to thank the uh, Sri Lanka College of Pharmacology and the Kandy Society of Medicine, uh, especially Dr. Nandika Harishchandra and Dr. Dhanth Madhik Madhagadha, the respective presidents, for organizing this uh, wonderful session on plural diseases. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the lectures um, chosen and, and the uh, eminent panel of speakers uh, invited um, gave rise to a very very uh, interesting uh, session for all of us. I think uh, a big thank you to uh, the expert panel of speakers, uh, Dr. Afla Sadikin, uh, Dr. Kerry Leong from Singapore, uh, Professor uh, Najib Rahman, uh, no stranger to uh, the academic activities of the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonology, and of course uh, our good friend Dr. Damikar Sanayaga who, as Dr. Tushara said, helps us out on uh, numerous occasions. Um, so to summarize the uh, lecture, um, Dr. Afla Sadikin initially spoke about uh, the approach to uh, unilateral plural effusion. And he went on to elaborate about the physiology and the pathophysiology of uh, unilateral plural effusion, and then stressed the importance of uh, especially clinical assessment, uh, which is to be followed by targeted investigation for uh, diagnosis. Uh, he went on to describe with evidence the utility of uh, plural imaging, especially plural ultrasound, uh, then followed by plural fluid analysis, uh, the importance of adenosine deaminase and cytology, and finally, uh, the value of histology and how to obtain samples for histology as well. Uh, he complemented all of this with uh, available evidence as well. And uh, finally, in this lecture, it was an eye-opener to me as well uh, to see in one study that there was a, such a high percentage of uh, unilateral plural effusion having more than one etiology. So I think this may be something that we need to look into more uh, in Sri Lanka as well. And I agree with him. Uh, it will probably uh, if we look into uh, then uh, Dr. Terry Leong went on to uh, give a, a very interesting talk on pneumothorax. Um, she updated us with the uh, latest evidence actually. Uh, and um, it was interesting to note that uh, uh, perhaps uh, especially with regards to pneumothorax, uh, uh, we may be in for a new guideline. And uh, the evidence uh, she presented suggested that it may be safe to observe some selected patients with spontaneous pneumothorax uh, rather than intervene. And also that uh, we should be guided more by symptoms rather than the size of the pneumothorax. Um, she also went on to describe the um, effective treatment of uh, pneumothorax with the uh, ambulatory uh, valve-based devices as well. Uh, so I'm sure um, this uh, new evidence will be included in the uh, upcoming guidelines. Uh, of course, um, with relevance to us in Sri Lanka, we must also uh, always remember that uh, um, the uh, ability uh, for patients to uh, reach uh, medical care and the uh, community support available is also uh, of utmost importance when we consider these new treatments. Um, and uh, Professor Najib Brahman, a uh, world-renowned authority on plural diseases, um, as we saw with uh, most of the or majority of the studies that were presented by the uh, speakers, we saw his name uh, as uh, principal investigator. Uh, he went on to describe uh, in detail uh, the, uh, up the current evidence uh, for management of malignant plural effusion uh, and also plural infection. Um, uh, to complement the previous speaker's lectures. Uh, so we learned that, um, uh, we learned about the optimal uh, way of uh, performing pleurodesis, uh, the tubes to be used, uh, and that um, uh, talc slurry, which we can do uh, at the bedside, is as effective as uh, talc pudraj. Uh, and he also went on to describe the advantages and disadvantages of uh, indwelling plural catheters. So I think a few years ago, uh, everyone was uh, very excited about IPCs, 
and uh, were of the idea that this would actually replace fluorodesis. Uh, but uh, Professor Raman presented evidence that this may not be the case. Um, and it seems that uh, uh, for different uh, pa patient populations, uh, there is a place for either IPC or pleurodesis, and that they may be equally effective if uh, patients are uh, correct, correctly selected and, and we take into account the patient's wishes as well. Uh, with regards to plural infection, he went on to describe new evidence to suggest that uh, histology may be useful uh, for microbiological diagnosis as well, or biopsy specimens. And also uh, the use of uh, TPA DNA, which I think needs to come into routine practice in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, I think one of the um, problems is cost, but uh, this is something that we can include and it is evidence based as well. Uh, finally, uh, um, Dr. Dammikra Snayaka went on to describe the surgical options available, especially for complicated rural diseases. And um, he described in detail the uh, specific options available for uh, late stage um, malignant pleural effusion, especially with uh, lung entrapment. Uh, and also uh, went on to describe the manage surgical management of empyema, especially stage two and three. And he stressed the importance of uh, referring early, um, especially in empyema, in order to prevent complications and ensure the best outcome. Uh, so to uh, wrap up, um, I would like to thank all the participants uh, who joined with us in addition to the speaker. And uh, I hope you had an interesting and enlightening time as I did uh, during this uh, two hours. And I hope your questions have been answered as well regarding plural disease. Uh, so in spite of uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists and the Candy Society of Medicine will continue to um, update you about various aspects of uh, respiratory disease. So please look forward to our upcoming webinars as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that brings to the uh, uh, end of our uh, meeting. Uh, uh, thank you very much for all four speakers who were well prepared and give a, a very comprehensive account. Uh, uh, but please stay online. Our uh, president of uh, Candy Society of Medicine, Dr. Madhagadhar, and our president, Dr. Nandika Harish Chandra, uh, want to have a small uh, few words uh, with you. Uh, yeah, I think yeah Dr. dear friends, yeah. Thank you very much uh, being uh, our resource person today and uh, helping us to continue conduct this webinar on plural diseases. As we are, we are continuing this, we had an ILD work webinar and we are going on the various other topics. And uh, Professor Rajnamam, Rajnamam, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, Dr. Kerry from Singapore, Dhammika, Dr. Afla, and, and the, finally the, the Damit nicely wrap uh, up the whole lectures. I think on uh, behalf of the, the Kennedy Society, I'm the current president and, and at the same time, and the scientific chair of Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. Thank you very much, all of you, uh, helping us to conduct today programs. And I, I, we expect your support in future as well. Thank you very much again. Thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, good evening. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nath Raman and uh, Dr. Kerry Leon, to join in us uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. Uh, I would like to thank all of you. And from our local speakers, Dr. Afra Sadikin and uh, Dr. Aldamika Rasnaika, thanks uh, for participating and giving, uh, giving us these uh, interesting talks because it's uh, very fruitful. Uh, and thank you very much. I think uh, President Raj is having a, another meeting at, uh, in, uh, <laughs> I think it's already started. So thank you yes, very much. Sadly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see you soon. I think uh, probably next year, we we'll like to know Dr. Dr. Sadikin, your co-panelist, uh, is going to be the uh, the president next year. So definitely, he's oh, well, waiting for you. <laughs> so thank you very much. It's a and, thank you for inviting me. It's a real honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank bye bye. You. Bye bye. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.